Okay, um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's webinar. And I know the very first slide is in Portuguese, but it's going to be in English, so bear with me. I will be talking to you tonight about bone modeling with manual osteoperforations, MOPS, and high frequency vibration. I am very grateful to propel both USA and Brazil for the invite. So thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, and sharing a little bit of what I do with micro perforations and vibrations. I am talking straight from Sao Paulo, Brazil. This is where I live and where I practice right now. Um, and what I wanna talk about is a little bit of paradigm shift. I am an ortho in Sao Paulo. I'm duly trained as a pedo first and then orthodontist for about 18 years. I've been in private practice and everything that you see on my screen now is what I was initially trained on. I was a basically edgewise doctor and I used all these um, auxiliaries, which I don't anymore. None of this in my office right now. I am not an Invisalign expert, so I will not be talking about um, aligners with you tonight. I will be showing you what you can do with um, braces and micro perforations and uh, Vibrations, not necessarily to accelerate, you know, orthodontic treatment as much as to remodel bone and treat your patients. Um, speaking of paradigm shift, I, if we just go a little bit back on the 20th century, we were dominated by the angle paradigm, where it was all about molar relationship, and that's all we looked at in and into is getting that those molars into class one, and if they were in class one, we were, to, we were told not to touch them, and so it was basically dental relationship that's all we looked into now we're on the 21st century we go into we transition into soft tissue paradigm where we're trying to treat all our patients based on the face and aesthetics right this is what they come in you know through the door to, in my office they're looking for beautiful smiles and most some of them really need facial change this is what they're looking for what i try to do is uh try to offer a different kind of treatment for the patients that have some kind of facial deformity or they need orthogonic surgery and they don't want to go through surgery. So by remodeling bone, we can help these patients not, not necessarily go through any kind of surgery. Um, if you guys remember, this is Profit, the Envelopes of Discrepancy in 1995, where we were told, if you remember, the yellow circle was where we could go with conventional brackets, right? Uh, orthodontics, mainstream orthodontics, that's what I practiced for about 10 years. Uh, and then the green would be functional orthopedics where the blue circle would be basically where we could do it, you know, we could go with surgery. And if you look at it, we can always work a little bit, a lot more on the lower th uh, third, which is the mandible than the maxilla, which is the mid face. So, that's our our main place where we work. But what I'm going to show you is what I try to do now in my practice is mandibular repositioning mechanism to all of my patients. And you'll see that I get, um, I wish I did get those class one patients that walk through the door and all they have is crowding, but I don't. I really get a lot of facial asymmetries and a lot of gummy smiles. Um, major class threes and major class two patients. And what I'm talking about mandibular positioning mechanism is I'm going to do an articular compensation, a vertical compensation, and a dental alveolar compensation. And for that, I need to develop the, the alveolus bone. So the patient, this is what you get by doing this kind of orthodontics. You can give this kind of patient, which is a big class three facial asymmetry, a new vertical dimension and stability and the case is treated. Um, so I'm gonna keep ask you guys to keep an open mind, you know, like a parachute, it works better when it's open. So bear with me as we go through this. We're gonna basically show you today is um, class two high angle and vertical control. So we're gonna talk about adults with class two, very high angle, and how we can control the vertical during, during growth, right, for um, adolescents. Uh, when we talk about class twos, there are four 
different types of a class two. So we have class two div one, we have uh, brachyfacial, mesofacial, and oligofacial, which is what we call hyperdivergent or high angle. And then the most difficult ones are the class two div twos because of the muscles, right? The muscles are so strong. So we're gonna concentrate on these, the high angle class twos. <clears throat> these are some of my patients and uh, I wish they were just you know, easy class two high angles, but as you can see, some of them are, I'm gonna go through the differences now. Uh, high angle patients, gummy smiles, don't smile. As you can see, they're, they train themselves not to smile, so the lips won't go up that high. Uh, they're very conscious about their how they look, and some, a lot of them, every, every single one of them doesn't want the gummy smile, but most of them don't want to go through surgery, a complete Lafour, and then, uh, you know, bond recontouring or gingiva removal, anything that in, requires surgery and blood, and, and uh, they don't want to go through it. So when we talk about class two hyperdivergent uh, high angle cases, these are just some of the characteristics that they have, but what they all have in common, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go through all of them and, and show you how I do treat, because when I'm, I'm finished with the patient, I finish a treat, not just the gummy smile, but the complete class two into a class one. Uh, but what they have in common is the one before the last excess vertical maxillary height, which is a dental alveolar compensation through growth. And that is what we're going to concentrate today and how to solve that. Because if I don't solve that, I can't treat these people. I, I can treat them into a class one, but I will not change the face. And this is the new paradigm. We're changing faces with orthodontics. So for example, this patient is a class two hyperdivergent, div one, but by retrusive. This next patient is a class two div one hyperdivergent with uh, protrusion, dental protrusion of maxillary dental protrusion. And this one is a class two div one hyperdivergent with maxillary protrusion. So three different types, three different treatments. But when we look at the morphological characteristics, they all have constricted maxillas. And sometimes <clears throat> you have, to, well, every time you have to develop the maxilla in order to bring the mandible forward. And when they have really constricted maxillas and the posterior teeth are very upright. That is so difficult to expand. And at the end, I'm gonna show you how I do that for adults. I don't use um, any kind of uh, mini screw or screws in a palate. I don't open a suture. I develop the alveolus bone and I'll show you how I do that. The lower anterior facial height is increased. So we have to decrease that before we do anything else. We're gonna treat the gummy smile, excessive upper incisor display. And that's where I'll be looking at through the entire treatment is how much incisor display compared to upper stomium they show uh, and intrude as much as I can, as much as the face allows me and the upper lip. And of course, we're looking for lip uh, competency at the end because they're very incompetent. Uh, they, they will not see your lips at all, ever. And try to get a, a anti-clockwise mandibular rotation of these patients, which is really important, just by doing uh, the full arch intrusion itself. So uh, these are the main things that we're gonna be looking at today, not the entire treatment, but you will see the patients at the end and how I finish. So if you look at this patient, you can see instant in the um, maxilla, you can see up on the, um, center incisor, the excess height of the bone that the patient has. And that's the amount of uh, intrusion that we're gonna make, not only anterior, but posterior. So this is why we call it a full arch intrusion, because we're gonna be intruding the entire um, upper arch, like a complete Lafour, like a surgical procedure. So the difference between now, we have class two div ones that are hyperdivergent. With a twist, they come with an open bite. So now we have a super version of molars. Not only do I have to intrude the upper arch, but I have to intrude the lower molars too if I wanna to close that bite. So things are getting a little bit harder now. Uh, they have a reverse curve of speed. They have occlusal interferences, lack of occlusal support. So it's an entirely different patient. But again, the part of the procedure that you're gonna see works for every patient right? If you follow this protocol, you can treat the vertical excess height of all the patients, regardless of their malocclusion, if they're, you know, class two open bite or not. 
So this one is a typical class two um, hyperdivergent open bite. And you can see with constricted maxilla and everything. And now we're gonna talk about after the adults, we're gonna look at the young children and how we can really redirect growth. Um, I remember when I was you know, in dental school, actually in residency, and then right after what we used to um, give our patients, those high pools, right, uh, headgears, and um, this, you're gonna see a different way to do this and how we can actually redirect growth. And these patients will grow to be very vertical, but we can completely change their faces. Um, so this is another example of a young kid and you can see his entire treatment at the end. Uh, so of all the treatment objectives that I have for all these class twos, I'm sorry, this isn't Portuguese, forgive me. So treatment objectives. The last one is the most important, which, which is really um, treat the excess maxillary height. Looking through the literature and why did it all start? Why did I get interested in this? I've been doing Propel since 2012. And I started first uh, just trying to, you know, accelerate tooth movement. And then by the results I was getting my patients and I was perforating at the time in 2012, it, it wasn't really established how many perforations, where they should be done, how deep and, you know, how long every other week, every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks, it, it, we were starting. So as I was, you know, playing around, actually, I shouldn't say that I was testing on the patients and I saw the results. I had a colleague, right? She's an orthodontist, she's a friend. She's a very, very gummy smile. And she was so afraid of surgery. So she, she came to me, she said, is there anything you can do for me? Is there any, any other alternative treatment that you can offer me uh, that we can actually treat my gummy smile and uh, with, without any kind of surgery? Because I will not do surgery. And that's when I started looking through the literature about gummy smile treatments. And this is a very interesting paper by um, Eric Liu and Dr. Um, Jay Bowman. And I do have the rights to show these pictures. I asked them for it. And it's in the JCO 2018. And they show three clinical cases. And this is the first case that really caught my attention. You can see a typical class two Div 1 hyperdivergent, uh, very gummy smile. And what they show is they call it a slow lift four. And they use four mini screws and to do the full, the full arch intrusion and distalization at the same time. So here's when I look at the case and you can see that the intrusion happening. And by the time they're done, there's this curtain of bone right on top of the incisors because everything went up, but the bone wasn't remodeled. So at the end of the full arch intrusion, it's 15 months of, of active intrusion, and then the reduced clinical crowns that we see, and there's this curtain of bone that is left there. So this patient will need a full flap, bone recontouring, and uh, crown lengthening after procedure. So to avoid a complete Lafour and then have to do a full flap and bone recontouring, I mean, that's what I wanted to offer my patients a different, uh, opportunity, a different procedure, a different treatment that they didn't have to go through this. So as you see, um, amazing results by them. But then again, when you do intrusion and distalization on mass movement, you don't allow the mandible to rotate, to auto-rotate uh, anti-clockwise because you're closing the space. So uh, that's something I didn't want to do either. I wanted to do a full arch intrusion without distalizing the entire upper arch. Uh, here's another case by them, the same paper, also amazing, done differently, using mini screws also. And at the end, the same thing, they need a full flap, they need bone recontouring, they're going to need uh, crown lengthening and, and all of that, which I said before. This is another paper, fairly new, 2016, published by um, Dr. Chris Chang, uh, Correction of uh, Gummy Smile. And again, you can see that um, she's very hyperdivergent. She has no chin whatsoever. Um, again, what they propose is uh, slow the four, the same way that I showed before, two mini screws on the anterior, two on the IZC infrazygomatic crest. They will do the complete intrusion. And at the end, he shows beautifully how he does the entire bone recontouring, the crown lengthening uh, procedure, 
and uh, because there is a curtain of bone left over there due to the intrusion and this is the end result and uh, what I wanted to to do for my patients is also be able to do a full arch intrusion but allow the mandible to come forward so they wouldn't end up with less upper lip support like in in those cases where you distalize everything. So I would like to treat them. Uh, that was my initial idea. I was looking for a way to do this, to do a full arch intrusion and still allow uh, anti-clockwise rotation of the mandible. Now, if we look into um, intrusion and the papers and everything that they say, we're talking about all these cases, 15 to 17 months of active intrusion. That's a lot, that's almost two years of just intrusion plus everything else that you have to treat afterwards. So uh, what the literature says is that you get uh, about 4, 0 0.4, half a millimeter of intrusion a month. So sometimes we're, we're gonna do seven millimeters, eight, nine, or 10 or 12 millimeters of intrusion, depending on the case. Uh, so I was also trying to get to speed that up, if, if that's possible, right? Because we do have to, uh, remember that there's bone physiology. There's so much we can do, right? Uh, we can't alter. We, I was trying to speed it up to a um, maybe a millimeter a month, so kind of double it. And then another, uh, the magnitude of intrusion that we see here, it, it will happen, you know, 0.5 millimeters a month. But what happened was every time you intrude, right, you end up with an open bite, an anterior open bite. So. Also, that it was something I didn't want for my patients. I, I thought, you know, there's got to be a way that I can intrude and avoid the bite opening because then I have another problem. You know, I do the intrusion and I end up with an open bite, anterior open bite. So I didn't want the incisors to flare and to be able to really in, intrude the upper arch. So I'm just, I was just jotting down all these things that I wanted to solve, you know, all these challenges in doing a full arch intrusion. And uh, so when we talk about a little bit about bone physiology and tooth movement, um, I just want to go quickly through this so you understand what I'm doing. When we talk about uh, orthodontic movement, any kind of orthodontic movement, anything that we do is literally uh, control trauma, right? We have to start any kind of movement. We need to put some pressure, and that is inflammation. So it's, it's an inflammatory process that we create uh, with too much force or too little force, or whatever you guys choose to do. I choose to keep my forces as light as I can possibly keep them. Like I said, I don't uh, use for these cases uh, aligners. I use passive self ligation. That's basically everything that I do in my office is PSL because it allows me less friction and it allows me lighter forces. And I do believe that the alveolar bone responds better to light forces than heavy forces. So, Looking into this is from Dr. Mani Alikani's book. Um, if we go back a little bit in, in those paradigm shifts, we started when I started. We believe that it was uh, we put great forces, big higher forces, because we had conventional brackets, and we know that, that is you know it's a little bit more uh, friction than self ligating brackets, past self ligating brackets. So we put higher forces. I remember, you know, class two elastis, class three elastis was somewhere around six to eight ounces. That's way too much for me nowadays, but that was a matrix deformation, un undermining resorption. So the teeth will be wobbly for three weeks. And that's how we thought it was, you know, uh, instead of physiological loading, it was a pathological loading and remodeling. So, and that was a lot of pain for the patient at the time. I remember because I was a patient at that time. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, about maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, we kind of started to understand that it's, you know, a new way, maybe lighter forces, there's a tension side, a compression side. Then on the tension side, you have, uh, I think I have uh, schematics here. No, hold on. So, uh, on the tension side, you'd have osteoclastic activity on the compression side and osteoblast. So it was resorption and then direct uh, bone acquisition at the same time. So catabolic and compression, anabolic and tension, simultaneous responses. And I believed in that for a little while too. But now we know that it's really, uh, yeah, here we go, sorry. So tension side, pressure side, uh, we tried not to compress the capillaries and we try to keep the, uh, all the oxygen and, and the blood supply 
to the PDL, so we would have a continuous movement of the tooth. But now we know that it's biphasic, and what do I mean by that? I mean that it's the target is the PDL, and we are creating an inflammation. And these inflammatory markers are the ones responsible for differentiating the cells into osteoclasts and osteoblasts. And the catabolic phase that starts, proceeds, and about 14 days later, it overlaps with the anabolic phase. So basically, we have osteoclasts arriving first, and then they, they are overlapped, and simultaneously, uh, osteoblasts come. And uh, so they work together. I think we can say, uh, here are our bone makers and bone breakers. I, I wouldn't call it symbiosis. I know it's not different species because that's what it means, but since it's a mutualistic relationship, I, I guess I can say that they work in symbiosis and to promote bone remodeling and bone modeling. So we have to understand that bone remodels and models throughout life. It's the only tissue in the body that doesn't scar. So there's no scar tissue in the bone and it's um, self-regulating. So uh, by using, uh, and I started doing this, right? Using the original accelerator until a few months ago, that's all I had. The original with the lead light. Now I do have accelerator RT, which I love. And I, I, and I modify it a little bit and you guys are gonna see in a little while what I do with it. And um, so by doing micro perforations, what we're really creating is bone injury. So it's an inflammation, right? And we're increasing cytokines production, which are proteins and glycoproteins. They're responsible for, you know, markers that will come and differentiate the cells into osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And this is oversimplifying it, of course. Uh, so we are increasing the rate of bone turnover. The, actually, when you keep the osteoclasts higher than the osteoblast by perforating the bone, you're increasing the bone resorption and by lowering bone density. So basically this is what we're doing. We're lowering bone density for a time, right? So we're just promoting original accelerator phenomenon. That's what we're doing. We're creating a big inflammation in sight. And by doing osteoperforations, which is uh, just like uh, little cuts to the bone, right? Um, and creating all this inflammation, cytokines is the famous cascade. I, I'm sure everybody knows by now. You've seen all the other webinars. Uh, and creating bone remodeling, ex accelerating by lowering, we're really lowering the bone density. And my thought was, what if I could, in a way, um, maintain the osteoclast plateau instead of allowing these cells to differentiate into osteoclasts and osteoblasts. What if I could increase the amount of osteoclasts in sight where to the point where they eat away the, the, you know, the lining cells and they really lower the density to the point where I can remodel this bone and, and call it osteoclast modulation. If I could modulate this in a way that I, you know, the amount of perforation or the depth of perforations that I was doing. So I would really remodel the bone to the point where I wouldn't need uh, any kind of surgery after the procedure. So here's the challenge is to do a full maxillary arch intrusion without losing my tads, right? So I choose not to use tads on the, on the labial side because the roots hit and then we lose them all the time. Uh, no bone recontouring, no crown lengthening or the bite opening. So many, many, many challenges. And I thought, um, so we're looking at the literature, uh, first torque insertion, I want to keep it between five and 10 Newtons. Uh, so I choose to use um, mini screws for full arch intrusion on the pellet. And this is a really nice paper by, by the Germans, Ludwig and Benedict Wilms and uh, Jay Bowman, where they, they've mapped out the best placement for mini screws on the pellet. So I go for D1 and D2, as you can see here. So somewhere between uh, five and the six, sometimes in the suture, sometimes not. And I'll show you, I've changed the protocol a little bit from the beginning. Uh, and I do use for TAD insertion, if it's interradicular or in the pellet, I use the orthonia or the accelerator PT. They're excellent. You can keep a uh, torque control, they're really cool. They have a contra-angle. You will go very perpendicular to the palate, and that's what I want. So I do use that. And so now, really pushing the envelope, I'm going to show you 
This is Amanda. She's uh, the very first patient that I've done this protocol, and I have right now 22 adults and seven young uh, adolescents, that you could call it. They're not children. So, and it worked, it has worked every time. So, Amanda was um, a volunteer, the very first one. She's a colleague, and um, she was very self conscious. This is Amanda at rest. This is Amanda uh, um, smiling, and uh, you can see the amount of incisor display and the gummy smile. And this is her uh, initial uh, lateral staff. She's been through, I think I was her third or fourth orthodontic treatment. She really didn't want surgery, even though her brother is a surgeon. He's an oral maxillofacial surgeon. She doesn't want any surgery. So the idea was to, she had braces at the time. So I debonded, rebonded passively. We want to start the full arch intrusion as fast as possible. Um, and I did tell her what it it would require require you know many micro perforations, and this is the setup uh, before the bonding. So this is the tad insertion and the first uh, mop, and I call it uh, biological activation. What I do you use for uh, every mop that I do, every biological activation and every tad insertion. This is a little protocol that I have. I've never had any problems with inflammation. Uh, or anything secondary to uh, perforations. And I do perforate them a lot. You will see it's a full arch perforation and I go very deep. So what I do is they they bring their own uh, correct chloroxidine. I ask for Perigard. They will um, gargle for two minutes. Then I put topical anesthetics for another two minutes, rinse well. Then I infiltrate with lidocaine. Uh, I do clean it with iodine, change gloves, put sterile gloves, and then I do the perforations and the entire procedure, the, the TAD insertion, whatever. And then the patient maintains this garg you know, gargling for two minutes, four times a day for four days. And then we're home free. I mean, it, it, it really heals very well after two days. And you'll see how perforations heal. But this is a protocol that I use even for TAD insertion. And it works very well. So here's the TADs. Uh, being placed on the palate, on the buckle, um, measuring the forces, keep those forces low, light, as light as possible. Um, and here's the perforation. You're gonna see what I do basically is I use uh, the propel and what I and I cut the sleeve because I go as deep as 12 millimeters into the perforation. Uh, it's not just um, two millimeters or five millimeters, it's all the way. Um, and then I don't like my patients to leave the office bleeding, so I use this um, gel that stops the bleeding. It's pretty cool. I don't want them walking out into the into the uh, reception with the other patients, you know, bleeding because some do bleed a lot. So this is two days after TAD insertion, the fi first micro perforations of Amanda. As you can see, you can barely see the micro perforations, but I do perforate once every interradicular, and then on the labial side and then I do on the palatal side too. Uh, you can't even see the palatal anymore, but you will see the next ones. And um, so 10 weeks later, I do perforations every 10 weeks. This is the second micro perforation done on Amanda and you can see here, it looks a little black because I use the hemostatic gel so it stops bleeding. Um, so here on every interradicular and I go high and then here's on the on the palate also. Um, so I perforate, like I said, all the way, all the way. I, I use the, it's about 12 to 14 millimeters. Uh, don't worry, you will not hit a root and especially on the palate. And it's, there's there's no artery or veins or anything there. So don't worry about it. It actually doesn't bleed as much on the palate that it, but it does on the, on the labial side. So every 15 weeks I activate the power chains, but no perforations. And then I just perf perforate every 10 weeks. So here's Amanda, and uh, this is beginning. This is uh, after second perforation. Usually these patients require four to five perforations. Uh, you see the patient is getting happy because she starts sending you selfies. This last one is a selfie. She's like, look at me, it's looking better. Uh, so 20 weeks, that's the third uh, MOP procedure or biological activation. Again, on the palate and um, Interradicular, always distal to the canines, never anterior to the canines. You don't need to. There's a form in there. You don't want to hit any nerves, trust me. Uh, so 
on the buckle, every interradicular space you perforate, uh, activate those power chains, keep the forces light. Here's Amanda, I believe after five months, this is third, 30 weeks, this is the fourth perforation. Again, the same way on the pallet, on the buckle, she's bleeding a little bit here, but um, you can see the five months down the road, how she's looking, it's going up. Uh, and it is remodeling beautifully. Uh, 40 weeks, this is the fifth microperforation. And again, the same way, the labial, just one. I don't do two or three, it just, you just require one, but you've got to go deep. And this is Amanda at rest, in the beginning, and then after 40 weeks. And this is her smile after 40 weeks. So 10 months down the road, we can see that um, this is the day that I removed the mini screws and you can see the complete remodeling. Uh, there is no bone recontouring. There's no uh, any kind of gum surgery. Uh, it was just full arch intrusion and uh, remodeling of the bone. There's a lot more to treat. Trust me, she's not done, but this is after intrusion. Uh, now we're gonna treat the class two, the facial asymmetry, the constriction and everything else. So Amanda at the beginning, Amanda after uh, full arch intrusion. And you can see that the height, the lower facial height is has decreased uh, quite a bit. Um, there is a auto rotation of the mandible just by intruding the upper arch. And now we have to do the class two mechanics that I'm doing right now by changing the occlusal plane. You can see here the difference, the amount of intrusion that was required in Amanda and how all the teeth are uprighted because you do intrude and they go up and there is the, you can see the roots and they're there. There's no uh, root resorption. There's no rounding of the roots. Here's treating the um, maxillary constriction, changing the occlusal plane as we speak, facial asymmetry, uh, centering midlines and uh, just finishing her case. She needs full mouth rehab. She has no cusp, no, um, fossas, she's got rest restorations on every tooth, but uh, you can see Amanda the day that we, here's her smile, beginning and end, and the day that we remove the braces, she still has to come back with her, um, her full pictures and, and her final x-rays. Again, she's a colleague, so go figure. So this is Amanda, very happy. I was happy she was the very first patient that we treated like this with a full arch intrusion. Now this is a very challenging case. It was, I think my fourth or fifth one, because not only is she biretrusive, she's very severe and she's got this huge exostosis. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, will I be able to do this? I mean, I can remodel, I could remodel Amanda and the other patients, but this, I've never had a patient with that much exostosis before. So that would be a big challenge for me. Again, this is her post smile but this is her real gummy smile. This is spontaneous. I got it off uh, Facebook because there's no way that she will ever smile like that when I asked her to. So this is her true gummy smile. Uh, that's the amount of exostosis that she had to begin with. Uh, so here's just uh, what we saw, the amount of excess um, incisor display that she had. Very difficult, uh, upper incisors were completely done. So. First, we have to do transverse adequacy, so expand the maxilla and give those incisors a good um, torque, flare them, literally. So when when I get to finally to, there's no can of the occlusal plane in this case, uh, when I finally get to stainless steel, right, this has to be done on 1925 stainless steel. It will not, you cannot do full arch intrusion on soft wires, otherwise it's not a full arch. So please be aware of that. Don't start from the beginning. Start when you get to, a, you know, this full wire. So 1925 stainless steel, this is TAD insertion, first micro perforation, and you can see that it's done. It's not bleeding anymore. We're intruding, so the palate and the buckle side perforated. Uh, five weeks activation only, uh, no perforation. And then 10 weeks, that's the second perforation that we do the entire labial side, and then the palatal, same thing as Amanda, perforate and then activate. Every five weeks, you activate the power chains. So this is just activation. Keep those forces light. You can see the intrusion happening here. 
um, very hard for her to brush. She wasn't a very good brusher, so we had big fights, but here's just activation. You can see her smile changing. Uh, this is five months down the road, so we can see just a big change here. Now, 30 weeks, um, when I looked, I saw that for some reason, some patients, one side will intrude faster than the other. Uh, so you can do just unilateral activation. You don't have to mop both sides necessarily. Uh, so I just activated the side that didn't intrude as well and um, perforate that and then activation for intrusion. And this is just, uh, you can see the palatal also, absolute torque control. So I always flip those brackets. Those are passive self ligation brackets. They don't allow, there's a, a resistant uh, lingual crown torque. So there is absolutely no flaring of the incisors and no opening of the bite. That's something else that I didn't want. You can see six months down the road what happened, and this is nine months, and you can clearly see a uh, auto rotation anti-clockwise of the mandible due to the full arch intrusion. And this is the amount of intrusion that we did on Chris. You can see the incisor um, torque already that we gained a very good torque for the incisors. Now all she had to do was change those hideous crowns, and that took a long time for her to do. Uh, and you can see that there's the entire exostosis, everything remodeled very nicely. Uh, it's just micro perforation. Nothing was done to uh, her at this point. Um, she did, she was a bad brusher. This is one of the day that we removed that uh, palatal screw. And as you can see, there was a big change. That's her smile. She looks younger. Uh, she's biretusive, like I said. We're still going to bring that mandible a little bit more forward. Now we're doing, we're finishing up with the class two mechanics, bringing her into a class one. She finally changed those crowns. You can see that the remodeling stayed and it's stable. Uh, remember, there is a stability phase and we're gonna talk about it at the end. Uh, once you do that much perforation and bone remodeling, you need to keep it stable for a little while. So here she is, uh, full large intrusion done bringing that, so you can see the height, the lower facial height, very, very um, much uh, lower than before. Um, the mandible did auto-rotate a little bit. Now I just need to bring it forward a little bit. That's her in the beginning. That's right after full arch intrusion. We just removed her braces two days ago. So this is nine months of active intrusion. And this is a very interesting case. She not only has, gummy smile, but she's got very constricted maxilla, open bite, and facial asymmetry. So I try to treat all of that. I don't think, um, here, so she's got gummy smile, high angle, open bite, lip incompetency, constricted upper arch, lingual frenulum, cantal maxillary, occlusal plane, and functional shift. So all of this have to be, has to be addressed. Same protocol as the other ones. You can see the, the, the amount of incisor display. And if, if you look at it well, if we align level that upper maxillary arch, that would be a lot of extrusion of upper incisors, right? And that's not how you close an open bite, how I close an open bite. I believe open bites are due to molar superversion, so you have to intrude molars, upper and lower molars. So here's the excess vertical, uh, the asymmetry, the constriction. So we're gonna solve all, all of that in, uh, First thing that we do is uh, the transverse adequacy, so expand the maxilla, um, get into stainless steel wires, and then do the entire procedure light, just like the other ones, mini screws in place. And I use stainless steel mini screws because um, they have to stay in there for quite a while. So I don't want uh, inflammation and th they're really, really good for this. So stainless steel mini screws, First biological activation, same procedure as the other ones, the labial and then the palatal um, activation, intrusion, activation only after five weeks, 20 weeks, third biological activation, um, same on the palatal, on the buccal, because it was going so well and it was intruding and these Kaplan hooks were cutting into the gum. It was really hard. I had to keep lasering them out. It was hard to activate. I changed the entire... Um, set up so I don't use that anymore. I do use now two mini screws on the palate, two on the anterior, um, three millimeters to the right of the 
palette will suit your two millimeters to the left, and it's a double purchase. So it's the palette and the Vomer palette and the Vomer, they stay beautifully. It works every time. I do that for children because they have less bone density. There's no way you can place a mini screw on the palette and, and it, it will stay. So 30 weeks, this is the new setup and activation. Then we have the fourth biological activation, microperforation, same way. Perforate, so this is initial 25, 40 weeks. Uh, we see that, I see, that there's a protrusion of the upper arch, so I'm gonna um, take advantage of the wrap that I have going on and just change the mini screws into two IZCs so I can distalize on mass and treat the protrusion. So here I have 40 weeks, and this is 60 weeks, only 20 weeks later, and it's treated. Uh, so now it's not protruded anymore. Now we have to treat that, remember that it was an open bite, so I need to intrude upper and lower molars. So I've intruded only upper, and she still has a facial asymmetry to treat. So 60 weeks after perforations, complete bone remodeling. You can see there is no crown lengthening, there's no flap opening, there's no bone recontouring, it's very healthy periodontium. There's no recession of gums, there's no fenestration. It looks pretty good, you can see there. On the ceph, the amount of intrusion that was done, uh, and then now her face is changing, protrusion, not protruded anymore, 60 weeks down the road. So initial 40, 30, 25, and 60. She starts posting selfies on um, Facebook. She never had a Facebook. Now remove the IZCs, and we're gonna change uh, into the lower molar so we can really change that open bite. And I'm gonna use uh, my mini screws as anchorage for my lower arch and molar intrusion because, I, of course, I don't want to extrude what I intruded in the upper arch. So here we have a very wide upper arch, lower arch. That's after the lower molar intrusion. You can see the auto rotation of the mandible anti-clockwise and closing that bite will never open again. Here's her face. We still have to treat the facial asymmetry. It's looking better, but it's not treated yet. So we're going to go for that mechanics of uh, different occlusal planes on the right and on the left. So we're changing, uh, extruding one side, class two mechanics, class three mechanics, giving her retrusive guidance, retrusive barrier. Now we're gonna bring the incisors down with, I prefer to use Australian wire and light elastics. So here's after 26 months of treatment, she is finally treated. This is the final result. So complete remodeling. No surgery needed whatsoever. Occlusion, stable, uh, treated to a class one, open bite closed, upper and lower, um, fixed retention, that's all I use. I don't use anything else. That's upper arch, lower arch, and uh, that's her face, finely centered, treated, nice smile, very full, um, showing every single tooth, I hope. No buccal corridor, she was very happy, I was very happy. That's her initial, that's after the intrusion, that's after molar intrusion, and that's after uh, the treatment. You can see clearly two occlusal planes, facial asymmetry. That is her uh, frontal initial and final. You can see the change and the constriction, the maxilla, and everything is treated. So she's very happy, very happy with the results. That's initial and final. And finally, I'm gonna show you, this is very easy because these young, patients, He's, he was treated with a, an extra oral where they distalize the upper arch to fit the lower. His mom is a speech therapist. She was really concerned because he didn't have any, he didn't see lips. He, he was a mouth breather. She knew where this was going. So she says, what can you do for me? And I said, I don't know, we'll try. So uh, what was done to him was the same setup, same protocol. The only difference is they have growth hormones. So you only need one biological activation, one microperforation, no more than this. So full arch intrusion, perforate just like everybody else, every interproximal on the buckle, and then on the palate, once, and then just uh, watch it intrude. This is after the intrusion, then this is after changing the occlusal plane, this is the final result, so treat him to, this is a biretrusive case, so treat him into a, a class one, upper and lower, and then if you look at his face, he did grow a lot. I mean, he's very, very tall. He's like six, four now. Uh, he was just a little guy when he walked in. So this is his final um, pictures, and 
That's his smile, no more gummy smile. And this is the initial, and this is the final. And you can see a tremendous change. I mean, this boy grew, but it was, I was glad that I was able to really redirect growth. So you can see the auto rotation and the more horizontal growth that he had, uh, as opposed to the beginning, you can see the menton where it was and where it is at the end. Very happy with the results. Mommy's happy, the boy's happy. I was thrilled. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about vibrations and how I use them. Uh, so I never use them alone. I use them together with micro perforations. Why? Again, thinking about, I modulated osteoclast. Now I'm gonna try modulate osteoblast. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I could just uh, keep the osteoblast coming or differentiating the cells into osteoblast more than osteoclast so we can have, at least maintain the bone, right? And we can have what we call bone drifting, is move teeth with the bone and not teeth through the bone. So I don't wanna lower the bone density, I wanna at least keep it and have uh, inflammation enough that I start the movement and then just keep that bone density the same that it is or maybe a little bit higher so I can move the bone to where I want to. So start with inflammation, perforations, and then vibrations right after it. And then just keep that, uh, the, the um, apposition of matrix and uh, higher than the bone removal or bone resorption by osteoclasts. So how do we do that? And what is it for? If you look at Mani Alikani's paper, and he says that by using micro perforations, high frequency and low magnitude, it increases the expression of the osteogenic markers. So uh, it decreases rank ligand and, and, and it activates OPG. So it, it allows for the cells to differentiate into osteoblasts instead of osteoclasts, right? So he says that he can maintain he accelerate the bone healing after tooth extraction and maintain uh, the bone density. So I, you know, that's a, in a case like this, for example, very constricted maxilla, girl had an accident, hit her incisors. What I do is I develop the arch as much as I can. And when it comes to a point where I can't develop it anymore and I need to keep control um, the posterior torque, I need some kind of arch that I have uh, lingual crown torque uh, because I'm going to do a hell of a lot of expansion here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mop the patient, right? Micro perforations on the labial side. Um, every interproximal two perforations, they're shallow. And then very deep ones on the palatal. And then do whatever you guys do for expansion. I love to use uh, mulligans overlay. Uh, and then the patient after perforation, they're going to wear um, vibrations five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening. And when you have a very, then you develop the arch, when you have a really, really persistent crossbite or just a region that it's not developing, you know what? You can just perforate that. You don't have to perforate the entire arch. So what I do is I play with it. You know, I see where I need it and I perforate more or less. So very deep in the palate, very shallow in the buckle. You can see here the asymmetry of the arch. The left side is developing, I'm sorry, the right side is developing more than the left. So I only perforated the left. And here you can see after six months and uh, three activations, and you can see that it almost, it, I mean, there is complete torque control. There's no flaring of the posterior. There's no fenestration. There's no uh, gum recession. And uh, there was a lot of uh, expansion of the upper arch. Now I can finally treat the lower arch and upright those teeth, because that's what it needs. So here's the final result after only six months. This is bonding, and that's after six months of, perforation together with microvibrations. This is another case, same deal, shallow mops on the buckle, deeper mops on the, on the palatal, and then uh, this is 60 weeks, this is 80 weeks. Sometimes uh, it takes, it, uh, actually not sometimes, it takes a long time to develop an arch like that. So I'm not doing faster orthodontics, I'm doing more efficient orthodontics, and I'm not using anything on the palate. I don't want to touch the um, the suture of these adult patients. It doesn't work every time. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do Marpy, Sarpy, whatever. I, I can just keep doing this. And this is the final result after eight, 80 weeks. Uh, you can see a beautiful arch, very stable. You can see here, uh, no recession. 
no fenestration, no flaring of teeth, so very controlled. Very, very difficult. This is another one also um, very difficult because the posterior teeth are upright to begin with. I mean, you know, there's no dumping, which makes it easier because 80% uprighting and 20% bone remodeling. So uh, what we're going to do is develop as, much, develop as much as you can. When it comes to a point where it doesn't go anymore, you can perforate in the beginning or you, you can choose when to perforate. Um, and you look and do the same thing, shallow perforations on the labial, uh, deep perforations on the palatal side. And then, I, like I said, I love to use mulligan. This is the end result that you get after the perforations. Uh, beautiful expansion. Again, you're not going to turn a dolical facial patient into a brachyfacial. That's impossible. But you can go to the patient's limit. There is, uh, you can see the wall ridges, and and uh, sometimes I do go beyond them on the upper arch because it will develop. But always look at the lower and try to uh, really do transverse adequacy as much as you can without um, flaring those close to your teeth. So this is um, what you get after I believe a year and a half. So no, sixty weeks less. So this is initial. This is on. I have a TMA wire here with. Uh, lingual crown torque on the posterior teeth still need one millimeter for that lateral incisor to make its way into the arch. Uh, so we're going, you know, easy light forces developing that is very stable. And talking about stability now, I'm going to talk to you about bone healing process because we hear a lot of things about vibrations and micro perforations and, um, you know, acceleration of tooth movement. And we forget that. The bone, we're, we're basically doing an injury to these bones. And what happens is bone healing requires a reduction and stability, rigid conditions. So every time, every case that I showed you here, there's a stability period, especially those full arch intrusions that you've got to maintain those mini screws and do your entire mechanics holding that upper arch or it will relapse. The reason I know is because I've done it. So it has happened to me. So there's a period of stability and it involves acute inflammation. And again, in order to generate, there's a, what we talk about, and you, I, I'm sure you've heard of that after perforation, you have a very less bone density. And then for a while, you have a higher density and more stability to your treatment. That is not true. You will have more density for a period, okay? And then the bone remodels and it models again into its original form right so it restores the normal bone structure that please understand that vibrations and micro perforations will not give you stability it won't give you stability um, what gives you stability is something else but bear this in mind you will have less bone density and then maybe a year down the road, you will have higher bone density, but that's just the healing process because we've injured the bone. After about a year and a half or within four years, sometimes it takes four years, the bone will go back to its original density, right? It doesn't matter if it's in the maxilla or the mandible, it doesn't matter where you do it, there will be higher density for a while and then it will go back to its original form. So. Again, what gives you stability? The true stability is in occlusion, right? So whatever you do to your patients, if it's upper arch expansion or if it's full arch intrusion, whatever it is, you need occlusion. That's what gives, what gives you stability. So it's functional occlusion and of course function. If I expand all these maxillas and my patient does not breathe through the nose and doesn't keep the lips sealed and doesn't keep the tongue up in the palate, guess what? it will relapse no matter how many perforations you do, no matter how, vib how many vibrations you use, that will relapse completely. So please bear that in mind. Stability is functional occlusion and functional. We still need that. Thank you.